started here. Uh, page 220, questions 11 through 16 from your reading last night. And uh, question number 11, how are roads and bridges designed to prevent buckling? What did you have for this one, Michael? Roads and bridges are designed to prevent buckling by incorporating rubber spacers to allow expansion and contraction. Or just gaps in general, but oftentimes there are, in concrete roads at least, you'll see those gaps. Um, uh, I think the uh, J.R. Allen Parkway is a lot of concrete, so as you're driving over there, ka-chunk, 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 you know, bridges, of course, you go ka-chunk, 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 as you're hitting the expansion gaps. Um, the asphalt, they don't worry about that as much, though asphalt also then forms cracks. Um, if you're in Phoenix City, random chunklets mm -hmm. of asphalt go missing constantly. I just don't get it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, expansion gaps. Yes, number 12. What three factors determine the linear expansion of a solid object, Audrey? Um, three factors that determine the linear expansion of a solid object are change in temperature, dimension of length, and coefficients of linear expansion. Good. Uh, number 13. What's the advantage of Pyrex glass, Michael? The advantage of Pyrex glass is that it expands very little when heated. Good. Number 14. How do the coefficients of area and volume compare to that of linear expansion? Um, Audrey. Um, compared to linear expansion, area and volume expansion um, describe the space that expands due to heat and the cross-sectional area that expands due to increase of heat. Mm, yeah, but how does it compare, though? Uh, Michael? Um, they compare by all depending on increase of heat. Mm. Okay. Area expansion is twice that of linear expansion, and volume expansion is three times that of linear expansion. Uh, let's see, number 15, how does solid expansion compare to liquid expansion? Let's go back to Audrey. Um, solid expansion with heat is less noticeable than liquid with heat. The volume expansion exceeds that of a solid by a factor of 10. The arrangement of mo molecules in liquid creates this, and solid atoms vibrate, expanding the entire object. That was a very, very thorough answer. Yeah, I was just going to say liquids expand more quickly. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, all right, good. Uh, let's see, number uh, 16. What unique property of water is beneficial to aquatic life? Michael? The unique property of water beneficial to aquatic life is that it, the water freezes at the top first, which uh, keeps the rest of the water insulated and prevents it from freezing. Okay. Um, I was looking for a little bit of a why in there. I'm not sure maybe Audrey added a little something else. Um, the unique property when the top of the water freezes first, inserting the warmer water at the bottom for, from further loss of heat. Okay, all right. We'll get into it in the lesson. All right, just curious. Uh, if we had a causation mentioned in there. Um, evidently, it wasn't super clear in the text then. Well, let's review some things we talked about yesterday before we look at the two homework problems. By the way, Kendall is here. We just, she had a homework pass, so that's why I didn't call on her. I'm not ignoring her. Okay. Why does he hate the short one? I don't hate the short, I love the short one. It's just, you know, she didn't do the homework. All right, um, <laughs> let's review. Uh, we talked yesterday about um, thermal energy, and we said thermal energy is actually the kinetic energy of what is thermal energy? No, it's not the same thing as heat. Okay, so it's the kinetic energy of the molecules of a substance. The atoms and molecules of a substance, as they have their own internal kinetic energy, again, the, the substance is not moving. This, this water bottle isn't going anywhere. There's a little vibration going on just because of like the floor shaking. I think it's Kendall's foot. Uh, but anyway, you can see the water kind of vibrating in the bottle. Uh, but even if it weren't, right, if it were perfectly placid, we know that the atoms and molecules are moving. Their movement is the kinetic energy that is thermal energy. The faster they move, the more thermal energy it has. And the measure of thermal energy class is called temperature. Temperature. So if I plunk a uh, certain device used to measure thermal energy called a thermometer, thermometer which used to have one sitting out too, if I were to plug a thermometer down in there, it would measure the thermal energy that that particular bottle has. The way it would work is the thermal energy that the water has would um, end up matching the thermal energy of the thermometer. The thermometer, I believe, has a, a red dyed alcohol inside that rises and falls. And um, as the uh, water touches the glass, which touches the alcohol, presuming that the water is a little cooler maybe than even the air around us, 
Yeah, it's a little cooler. Uh, presuming that the water's a little cooler than the air around us, it would draw thermal energy from the glass, which would draw from the alcohol until they all three reach the exact same thermal energy. At that point, we would read the thermometer. What's that point at which all objects touching in contact reach the same thermal energy? Thermal equilibrium. And, uh, but as I mentioned, the thermal energy will flow out of the glass and flow out of the alcohol into this bottle of water. Now, it won't affect the water's thermal energy level much at all. It's not like, man, look at the thermal energy. Look at the water start to move as the thermometer is pumped in. Now, I suppose if you took like a boiling, you know, boiling water and added it, or maybe something that was in boiling water and dropped it in, you could see the temperature rise. For instance, um, any of you hard boiled eggs? No, you don't hard boil. Okay. Ever, it was, ever, anyone ever done it before, like boil eggs, and then you, you want to cool them quickly because otherwise the yolks get all brownish, grayish, weird. So you want to cool them quickly so you drop them into ice water. And uh, that cools them down. Also, that allows them to cool quickly so you can, you know, crack them open without burning your hands. But uh, so you get a pot with ice in it and you dump the eggs in and you like you can see the ice melting right before your eyes. Why? Because the ice is absorbing thermal energy from the very hot hard boiled eggs, right? They were at a higher temperature. Well, you wouldn't see that happen here probably with just a simple thermometer. The thermometer is not going to change the thermal energy levels much at all, would it? All right. Um, but the heat would flow from where the higher thermal energy is, presumably the thermometer, into the water. That flow of thermal energy is what we call heat. We tend to think of the two as the same, but technically heat is the flow of thermal energy. It is a change in energy level. Think of it this way. Remember we said work, right, is the, uh, is the transfer of energy. Energy, the ability to do work. Energy, something has moved. Well, when thermal energy moves from one place to another, that's heat, if that helps you remember that. Um, it's kind of like thermal work, if you will, kind of a weird thought. But anyway, the flow of thermal energy is called heat. Thermal energy is actually the kinetic energy of the atoms and molecules themselves. Now, we said when we measure thermal energy, or we measure temperature, uh, there's three different scales we could use. One of them, scientists don't really use anymore in class. Okay. Fahrenheit. But we use Fahrenheit. We like Fahrenheit. And... Um, Fahrenheit, rather, rather awkwardly, water boils at the, the random 212 degrees. It freezes, pure water freezes at the rather random 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Why? Why would, why would Gabriel Fahrenheit come up with such weird numbers? Well, he didn't. Do you remember what he based his temperature scale on? Well, the difference in degrees was noticeable difference. That's one reason why the numbers are a little weird. Why else? He used a saline solution to freeze at zero, which, so pure water froze at 32, which was kind of awkward. So scientists be like, yeah, we don't like that. We're lazy, we don't like weird numbers. So scientists come up with a new scale, which we call the Celsius, Celsius scale, where water beautifully freezes at and beautifully boils at, and everything in between becomes a degree. Just divide, divide it up equally into degrees. Um, another guy comes along and says, wouldn't it be even better if there were nothing below zero? So he says, let's come up with a scale where the lowest temperature ever possible is zero. And you can only work your way up. You don't have to deal with negatives this way. It's great. Who was that guy? Lord Kelvin, you read about him in your homework last night. By the way, as we've seen a trend, great scientists, Christians who believed and trusted in God, right? Who saw his handiwork, who saw the order and the design and the and in creation. So anyway, but Lord Kelvin came up with this uh, new scale, which is called the uh, Kelvin. Kelvin scale. Like, egotistical a little bit, I guess. Um, but hey, if I came up with a whole new temperature scale, I did all that work, the Nadasky scale. Kids lose points for spelling all the time. All right, <laughs> just because that's evil. Um, but anyway, um, <laughs> ha, spell that one right, kid. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's not the worst name. Like, there are worse names out there in history class, right? They're trying to remember how to spell them and stuff, so. Anyway. <laughs> um... But uh, the Kelvin scale, how did he, because we've never reached absolute zero or zero Kelvin, right? How did he deduce that this must theoretically be the lowest temperature? Kendall, do you remember? Hmm, Audrey? Kind of built on Jacques Charles's work a little bit, if that helps. 
I am gas because the freezing point is in the same thing. Yeah, and at the freezing point of water at zero degrees Celsius, if you decrease the temperature by another degree, the uh, gas, as the energy level drops, the gas contracts one two hundred seventy third of its volume. So by pretty simple math, now again, the testing to get to that conclusion was not that easy, but by simple math, then you need to go down 273 degrees and there will be no gas left of any kind. Most gases, as I said, liquefy long before they get down near absolute zero anyway, um, but all gases, no gas could exist at negative 273 Celsius or technically negative 273 0.15 degrees Celsius, and that's absolute zero. So a good number to remember is absolute zero is zero Kelvin, or it's negative 273.15 degrees Celsius. Now, Michael, you mentioned um, 273.16. Now, what you're thinking of is 273.16 Kelvin, or 0 0.01 degrees Celsius. So that is a special temperature. That's not one that we need for converting back and forth. This is the number we use to convert back and forth. If we want to go from Celsius to Kelvin, we add a 273.15. If we want to go from Celsius or Kelvin to Celsius, we subtract 273.15. What is this number, or you could say this number? What's its special class, or why is it special? Triple, Triple point of water. Now, it's not to say that at 0 0.01 degrees Celsius, water will exist in all three phases because it took more than just the temperature, because we have days here in Columbus, Georgia, where it's 0 0.01 degrees Celsius. This morning, it might have been pretty close to that. And water, if you had a water bottle, was not ice, water, and steam all at once, or vapor all at once. What had to also be true at this temperature to get water to exist in all three phases? I don't even need to remember the exact number, but really, really, really low pressure, practically a vacuum, not quite a vacuum, but really low pressure at that temperature, water could exist in all three phases. And we say that the triple point of water is what we use for the reference point for both Celsius and Kelvin. It's used to calibrate those scales because it's such a unique temperature. Um, let's see, make sure I reviewed everything. Oh, conversions. We practiced with these in our homework. I referenced one of them already, the Celsius to Kelvin. We just based it off of this number, remembering which scale is going to be the bigger one. Kelvin's going to have the bigger numbers because it doesn't go negative as well as Celsius does. Then we also had to be able to convert from Celsius to Fahrenheit really just because we here in the U.S. like our Fahrenheit. So we want to be able to relate to what we're talking about. And so uh, what's the formula to go to the Celsius? This is the most common one we'll need because I'll probably give you Fahrenheit rather frequently, right? Um, just because we relate to Fahrenheit, but we have to change it to Celsius to do anything with it. What's that formula, Kendall? No, um, yeah. Other one. Other one, five nine. Uh, times two, so, uh, There we go. We'll subtract the 32. That brings us to the zero point. And then we'll multiply by the five nines because for every five Celsius, there's nine Fahrenheit that go with it. The one that we used to using in our younger days, which we really won't need very often here, is actually converting to the Fahrenheit, which why would we need that? Unless it was. Hey, this is what's going on. Now let's convert it into terms we can understand. So what is the Fahrenheit scale, or a temperature conversion? 92 plus 32. There we go. And again, the 32 gets tacked on at the end, where here it gets tacked on, or it gets taken away at the beginning. Um, you were using these temperature conversion uh, the thingies. Uh, formulas, that's what they're called. Formulas um, to do problems three and four. Problem number three. Go ahead and read that if you would, Michael. Um, liquid nitrogen has a temperature of 77 G Kelvin. Express the temperature on the Celsius scale and the Fahrenheit scale. Good catch. You started to say 77 degrees Kelvin. He's like, no, that's right. There's no degrees in Kelvin. 77 Kelvin. And it says express the temperature on the Celsius scale. So 77 Kelvin equals how many degrees Celsius? What do we have to do to go from Kelvin to Celsius, class? Take away 273.15. So. When we do that, what do we get, Michael? Negative 196.15. Negative 196.15. However, they have nearest whole number. And when we're subtracting, we have to go based on place value. So we're going to round the nearest whole number and say? Negative 196. Negative 196 degrees Celsius. But we're going to use the actual negative 196.15 to then convert to degrees Fahrenheit. So we would take 9 fifths of that and add 32. 
And uh, Michael, what do we get for our Fahrenheit temperature? Good. Now, realizing that we did start with a two sig fig number, this involved multiplication. So I'm going to go back to the multiplication rules. Two sig figs will say uh, negative 320. Negative 320. If you did negative 321, I don't know that I get too picky because it is kind of weird having both of those operations in there. But yeah, negative 320 degrees Fahrenheit will be our answer here. How many, or I guess, Audrey, did you also have that? Kendall questions on what we did. By the way, notice that Kelvin and Celsius go up and down together. They start at different baselines, right? If you're going all the way down to the bottom, 0 Kelvin, negative 273.15 Celsius, but they go up equally with each other. We could refer to them class as being equal interval scales with each other. Uh, problem number four. Uh, read that one for us, Audrey. If a Celsius thermometer indicates a temperature of 35 degrees Celsius, what would a Fahrenheit thermometer be in the cell room? All right, and uh, for this, we just had to plug it into the formula. Good, so you took 9 fifths of 35, you added 32. What did you get? 95. Yes, 95 degrees is correct. How many 90, did you also have 95.0 degrees Fahrenheit? I just had 95. Oh, okay, 0.0. They have three C phase. Uh, <laughs> questions on that one. By the way, I didn't mention this, but it, it came to mind when it said 35 degrees Celsius. You should remember what normal body temperature is Celsius. 36. It had been 37. They've since said, okay, 36 is actually the current normal human body temperature. So if we also then remember on the Fahrenheit scale, old normal body temp, mm -hmm. new body temp, 97 and a half, 35 degrees Celsius could be really close to 97 and a half. So it makes sense when you get an answer like 95. And so um, anyway, that's, that's good for reference there. All right, questions on the homework at all? Kendall had a homework pass, didn't have to do it. Any questions? All right, let's go and move on then to what you read about in your homework reading, and that is um, this idea of heat transfer, right? As, as thermal energy flows from one body to another, energy is being transferred. One could argue work is being done in a sense, um, but uh, thermal energy is changing, right? As heat flows into something. So for instance, you put a pot on the stove, you turn on the burner, and heat, thermal energy flows into that pot. You are changing the energy of the pot. Well, as you change the energy level, what you're doing is making the atoms and molecules, now the pot is still solid, right? The pot doesn't suddenly melt, hopefully. And now if you have a plastic container and you forget that the stove is hot and you set it down on hot stove. Anyone ever done that one? Yes, it will melt, and uh, so plastics will do that. But the metal doesn't suddenly turn into a liquid, okay? Um, and there's a bad smell too when the plastic melts. Uh, but anyway, it doesn't suddenly turn into a liquid. It's not that they're free-flowing molecules, but they vibrate more rapidly. There's a greater vibration. Now picture this, picture, um, picture all the high school. Let's just suppose we all got together. There was, uh, imagine we had a sports team. <laughs> And we were selling, we all rushed the court, we all run to mid court, and uh, we're jumping up and down, and we're just so excited, okay? Now imagine if I said, okay, we want everybody to squeeze in for a picture, everybody be still. If we were all still, we could, well, okay, we could all squeeze in for a picture, however, you know, imagining we, you know, didn't mind being squished up against somebody like Michael. Um, you know, we, we could get close for a picture, right? But if we then decided to go jump up and down and scream and holler, it would be a lot harder to stay close together. Naturally, the group would just begin to expand, would it not? Now, that's not a perfect illustration of what's happening, but it gives you a visual of what's going on with these atoms and molecules. If the vibration is greater, the whole unit has to expand to make room for the increased vibrations. That kind of gives you a visual of what kind of is going on. Similarly, as I said, if we said, okay, everybody settle up, everybody settle up. We need everybody come in for a picture, so please. Stop jumping up and down for a minute. We just need everybody to come in for a picture. If I could decrease your energy levels, I could get you to come in closer. If I decrease the energy level of a solid, I can get the solid, the atoms and molecules, to come in closer, and the object will contract. So we need to understand this, that as thermal energy or as temperature rises, a solid will expand. As energy drops or the temperature drops, the object will contract. We call this thermal expansion. And that's the next section in your notes, thermal expansion. 
Three factors really affect thermal expansion. And of course, you read about expansion gaps, how they're there so that way, as in the hot summer days, the road expands, the uh, pieces of the road don't actually push against each other and start cracking. Um, again, cement, concrete being the, the things that need that the most. Um, Pyrex glass is used for cooking because for the most part, unless it's defective, it can be heated without suddenly like shattering. Now you've probably heard reports of, anyone ever had a Pyrex glass dish shatter on you? I've never had it. I've seen like videos of it and people complain. That's defective glass, okay? Uh, but the Pyrex glass is tempered in such a way that it can withstand high heat. It doesn't expand rapidly. Some substances do expand rapidly though. And so one of the factors that affects thermal expansion is the type of material or the substance itself, you might say. Softer substances like rubber will expand more rapidly. Harder substances will expand less rapidly. And um, if you would, just in parentheses, put coefficient of expansion. Because every individual type of substance has its own coefficient of expansion. If you look at page 211, there's a table there of different values. The higher the number, the more rapidly the substance will expand. So as I'm looking here, the biggest number I see is a hard rubber, right, with 80 E negative 6. Okay, well that, of all the substances listed there, is the softest of the substances. Uh, the smallest number, though, um, INVAR, okay, is used in clockwork you know, where they don't want things expanding. That could cause problems. You also see Wood doesn't really expand too much. Interesting. Um, again, I think we're assuming they're dried wood, but um, again, makes it nice for building houses out of because the wood isn't going to expand too much or contract too much. Um, but every different substance has its own, you know, ability to expand or contract. So the type of material makes a difference. The next thing that determines the thermal expansion is the change in temperature, or we'll just say temperature change. Obviously, the greater the change in temperature, the greater the increase or decrease in energy, the greater expansion or negative expansion, contraction, would take place. So that makes sense. The final thing also kind of makes sense. Um, kind of like, remember when we talked about uh, stretching a rubber band? Instead of having a little rubber band and I stretch it a half an inch, okay, versus I've got like six inch long rubber band and I stretch it a whole inch. Well, proportionally, that may be just about the same. That which is big has more atoms and molecules that could expand out, right? If we took a group of, I don't know, 20 high school kids and we pushed them all together and then said, okay, now start jumping up and down and try to stay as close as you can while you're doing it. Okay, they'll expand a little bit, right? If we took 200 people and filled them on a basketball court and got them jumping up and down, they're naturally going to expand more. Proportionally, it may be the same, but the actual expansion will be more because there's just more people. A larger object will have more notice, will have more expansion than a smaller object will, even though proportionally they may expand the same. Does that make sense? So the original size of the object, of course, makes a difference as well. The original size of the object is going to make a difference in thermal expansion also. Now there's three different types of thermal expansion, and there are one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional. One-dimensional simply looks at the length. As far as a bridge being constructed, if the bridge expands in its width, who cares? There's nothing over there. It's a bridge, right? Um, if it expands in its depth, really not too big of a deal, right? I mean, maybe that first bump as you get off from the road to the bridge, maybe you notice if the bridge expanded, you know, a quarter inch higher. End to end is what we're most concerned with, right? Because if these pieces of bridge were touching each other, even a quarter inch from each of them expanding would cause a problem now if there were no room for it, hence the expansion gaps. So one-dimensional expansion we call linear expansion. That only concerns itself with length. And that's where we're gonna start, is in the simplest form of expansion, which is just one-dimensional length expansion. Here's our formula. The change in length, we'll say delta L, is equal to alpha, that's that coefficient of linear expansion that you see at the bottom of page 211, L sub O, that's the original length. Here's the neat thing, the units can be anything. I should have said any units. <laughs> the units can be anything. If they give you centimeters, just stick with it. They give you meters, they give you feet, they give you inches, they give you millimeters, whatever units they give you, just stick with it. We don't really care too much because 
The last factor is the change in temperature. Now the change in temperature does have to be in degrees Celsius, make that note. Also remember, a change is always final minus initial. So when we see temperature change, it has to be final temperature minus initial temperature. In most of our problems will work, we'll assume we start at a lower temperature and we rise to a higher final temperature. So a high final temperature minus a lower initial temperature gives us a positive change. That'll spit out a positive change in length or an increase in length. But imagine the temperature drops, right? We've had some days like that, not a whole lot of them, but we've had some days where everything, the temperature drops. Well, in that case, the final temperature would be lower. Lower minus higher gives you a negative change in temperature, which in turn gives you a negative change in length. That means the object shrinks or contracts rather than expanding. Does that make sense? So if we're calling it expansion, we understand we could get negative expansion, which would be contraction. The units for alpha, if you look in your textbook at the bottom of page 211, you'll notice the, the units are in per degrees Celsius. All that matters then is that the per degree Celsius cancel with this degree Celsius. And that's why you could use any units for the original length. Whatever units you have are the units you'll have in your answer for the change in length, which is kind of neat for a change. After suffering through section after section after section with, hey, we don't do centimeters, we don't do millimeters. Hey, now we can if we want to, it's great, all right? I'm also gonna do this for our purposes if the, the, the changes are gonna be so minute, right? A, a two mile long bridge, if you put it all together, its thermal expansion on a hot day might be a few inches, maybe. No one's even gonna notice a few inches of expansion. And it's miles long. So we're gonna get really small decimal values oftentimes for the change in length. I mean, look at the coefficients, they're all E negative six, they're all millions of a per degree Celsius. So because of that, I'm going to want lots of sig figs available to me. I'm going to pack all the sig figs into the original length. You notice the alpha values don't have a lot of sig figs in them. They're one or two sig figs. The uh, change in temperature, usually I'm not going to give you, you know, 40.0000 degrees. So I'm going to look at the sig figs and the units for the L sub O. And I'm going to use those in the answer as well. So just make a note of that. As we work these problems, whatever the original length has for sig figs, whatever the original length has for units. Just keep them both. Make your life easy. Understood? Let's look at an example problem then of linear expansion. They're on page 211. Let's try page 212. <laughs> page 212, example 14.5. And read the example problem for us, if you would, Audrey. A single steel span in a bridge is 100 meters long at zero degrees Celsius. A, how long is the, four, is the span at 45 degrees Celsius? B, if there are three such spans in one bridge, how much will the length of the bridge increase from zero degrees Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius? All right, so we have a 100 meter long bridge span, and that's at zero degrees Celsius. So in our terms, it's 32 degrees outside. It's a cold day. And then somehow, over time, temperatures increase to 45 degrees Celsius. Um, Let's see, that's going to be at over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So we live in the South. <laughs> um, <laughs> where it gets really, really, really hot, okay? The question is, how big will that same span be at that increased temperature? Well, pretty straightforward. We plug in some numbers. First of all, remember I said the coefficient of expansion is based on the type of material. What is this bridge span made out of? Steel, not concrete or whatever. It's made out of steel. So. Look to the previous page. What is the um, coefficient of expansion for steel? 11e negative, e negative 6 per degrees Celsius. All right, then we want the original length. Well, what's the original length of this span of bridge? 100.00 meters. Notice, when I get my answer for the change in length, it's going to have what unit? Meters, and it's going to have how many sig figs? Five, because that has five six figs and that has meters. Whatever the L sub O, the original length has, <clears throat> that's what I'm using for my change in length. I'm not, I don't care about six figs here and units here. Uh, because the degree Celsius here, I'm just gonna cancel with the temperature change degree Celsius. What is the change in the temperature here? 45, 45, it goes from zero degrees to 45 degrees, probably not in one day. Though in the South, no, realistically, it would, it would have to take months. But anyway, over months of time, the temperature uh, increases. What's the temperature change, class? 
45. Positive or negative 45 degrees Celsius? Positive. went up to 45. Notice that per degree Celsius and degree Celsius cancel, and we just multiply. 11 and negative 6 times 100 times 45. And what do we get for the delta T, or delta L, excuse me, change in length? That's three sig figs. I wanted five, so we'll say, oh, yeah, how much will it increase? No, it doesn't say that. It says how long is the span. It didn't ask for the change in length. It asked for the new length. If it increases and it changes this much class, right, what will be the new length if it started at 100 meters? The new length, L sub N for length new, <laughs> will be 100.0495, or rounded off here, class, 100.05 meters, meaning that whole span grew five centimeters. Yeah, that'd be about five centimeters. That whole span, you, nobody's gonna even notice that unless there wasn't room to expand that little bit, right? Um, and again, that's a pretty extreme case. I mean, 45 degree temperature change, yeah, we're probably good. Um, now, it did also ask, though, what if there's three spans in this bridge? So it's a 300 meter bridge, right? There's three of these spans. What will be the increase of the length? What do I need to do? Take this change in length times three. And what is the increase in the length of the bridge? And here's where I'm gonna tack on one more zero for the sig sixth sig fig. We'll say that many meters. Basically 14, 15, almost 15 uh, centimeters. So about that much as the entire bridge's increase. Okay. Questions on the example problem? Do you see how to plug in the numbers? Pretty straightforward. All right. Um, if you would in your notes, that was linear expansion. Let's talk about area expansion. We understand in reality, although we only care about the change in length of a bridge, the bridge's width will change as well, won't it? It'll change in two dimensions. But think about it. If you think in two dimensions, the other dimension could be thought of as a length as well, couldn't it? So area expansion is going to be found by this formula. A, or delta A, change in area, is going to be, and we're going to use the letter gamma to represent the coefficient of area expansion, A sub O delta T, where the gamma is the coefficient of area expansion. We use alpha for length, gamma for area. However, you notice they didn't give you any gamma values on page 211? They only give you alpha values? That's because gamma, for all practical purposes, is simply 2 alpha. So because it's two-dimensional instead of one-dimensional, you multiply by two. And then by not original length, but original area in squared units times the change in temperature. Does that make pretty logical sense? So is it really a new formula? Not really. Just remember you have to double the alpha value. Well, technically, right, when you heat something, it'll expand not just in length, not just in width as well, but also in depth, won't it? That would be volume. Well, you get a volume expansion. You probably could guess the formula almost. Delta V equals, we're we'll use beta as our coefficient of volume expansion. V sub O, delta T. Notice it's pretty much the same equation, except instead of changing length, it's changing volume. Instead of original length, it's original volume. Alpha becomes beta, but beta is three dimensional. It's just basically three alpha. So if we have a volume expansion problem, we just triple the alpha value. Because we now have not just a length and a width, but also a height. All three dimensions will change proportionally at the same rate. So tripling the alpha value takes care of the beta, which is why we don't need a separate uh, table with the beta values. So really, memorize this one. If they talk about area and squared units, double. If they talk about cubic units, triple. Seem easy enough? Questions on these ideas? Now, one thing to note, um, it, when it mentions area expansion, notice it shows the example of a little washer there that's been heated and now glowing orange, and it mentions that as something is heated, everything expands outward. It doesn't expand inward to fill the hole. It, the hole even expands outward. The whole thing expands outward. So although the area is increased, so would be the area of the hole. Something interesting there. 
Um, liquids. You need to jot this down. Liquids expand more rapidly than solids. Liquids expand more rapidly than solids. Liquids expand more rapidly than solids. Now, think about practical here. Your body is mostly liquid, right? The cells of your body are liquid. Um, granted, you've got parts of you that are, are fairly, like bone, for instance, pretty solid. There's even some liquid in there. Um, but you are primarily liquid. Um, so, for instance, uh, if I had a metal ring, right, it will expand if I heat it. If my hand also gets heated at the same time, my hand will also expand. My hand will get fatter and pudgier. The ring will expand, which will expand more quickly. My hand. So hence the ring will feel tighter if I am working out or doing some hard manual labor. My blood flow increases, my body temperature increases, my hand expands, the ring expands, but it will feel tighter. Have you ever noticed that maybe with a watch or with a ring that they feel tighter when you're warm? And then the same watch that fit really tight, or the same ring that felt really tight in summer, you get to the winter time, you're outside for a little bit. Well, again, what's gonna happen is temperatures drop. Everything contracts. Well, which one's gonna contract more rapidly? The metal ring or watch or the hand? Hand, right? So hand contracts, and as hand contracts, ring also contracts, but hand contracts more quickly, suddenly think, th things feel loose. Um, I, uh, I was, newly married years ago, um, sitting in chapel, um, and I was playing with my ring because I'd never worn a ring in my life. Like, never, why, why would I? We were poor, we didn't have money for rings, why would we do that? So anyway, I'm playing with the ring, and it's kind of sliding it on, sliding it off, sliding it on, sliding it on, slid it on this hand. Now you know the wedding ring goes on the left hand, third finger. I slid it on my right hand, third finger. And um, I use my right hand a lot more than I use my left hand, because I'm right-handed. Everything gets done with this hand. So consequently, you can't tell an appreciable difference, but this hand is a little bit thicker. And I slid it on, and I suddenly realized I can't get it off. And of course, I'm, I'm the supervisor. I'm supposed to be dignified sitting here in chapel. So I'm sitting there like trying to get the ring off, and um, I can't get it. So now, you know, <laughs> making a little bit flustered. We're going to lunch afterwards, so I, I swing by my wife's classroom. This is back when she was teaching, of course. And, and that, no, no, you, you were... You were later on in her teaching. You were one of her last classes, mm -hmm. I think. You weren't her second year. Anyway, so I uh, go in there and I say, hey, I can't get my ring off. Can you get it off? She tries. She can't get it off. And she's like, go run it under cold water. Mm -hmm. Duh, I should have thought of that. Because what's going to happen as I leave my hand under cold water for a little while? My hand's going to contract a little bit. So will the ring, but not as greatly. And I was able to get it off. And I decided I'm not going to play with the ring. When I'm in chapel, I'm going to learn my lesson. But what was happening while I was tugging? Friction. What's friction doing? Causing heat. What's the heat causing? Thermal expansion of the hand. Volume expansion, or area expansion. If you're looking at the cross section, had a hard time getting that off. Uh, look at uh, page 213. Page 213, example 14.6. And let's look at an example of volume expansion. Kendall, if you'll read the problem for us. A hollow rubber cube has a volume of 1,000 centimeters cubed at 100 degrees Celsius. If the cube is submerged in boiling water, all right, so we've got um, boiling water, 100 degrees Celsius. We have a little cube of rubber, plop, into the water. We took it out of the uh, freezer, I guess. Most freezers are colder than zero degrees Celsius, but it's definitely not the fridge either. Anyway, it's been sitting outside on a cold winter day in Georgia. Tuss, zero degrees Celsius is cold. And so we drop it into the pot, and eventually, again, assuming the water is continuing to boil, meaning it's sitting over the, um, sitting over the element, you're not gonna attain thermal equilibrium where the water temperature drops because you're constantly heating it, right? So eventually, that cube will reach what temperature? 100 degrees Celsius. So what is going to be the change in temperature of this cube? 100 degrees Celsius, a positive 100 degrees Celsius. Um, and it says the original volume is uh, 1,000 point cubic centimeters. There's your four sig figs, and cubic centimeters will be our units. Remember, original anything is what you're basing sig figs and units on. And then um, this type of material, remember, gives you your coefficient. Now, technically, what Greek letter do we use for the coefficient of volume expansion? 
beta technically, but they don't give us beta. So we just need to remember that anytime we have volume, we're going to use triple alpha. We're going to use three alpha. Where, uh, let's see, it's made, it said it's made of hard rubber. Let's see, uh, hard rubber has a coefficient of 80, E to negative 6. Triple 80 we get 240, E negative 6. Now I know in, in scientific notation that's written wrong, but so is the 80, E negative 6. We're just going to plug it into the calculator anyway. And so we'll use our equation for change in volume. What's the equation for change in volume class? You literally just multiply the three things together. Again, technically, if you were to say on a quiz or test, by the way, that the equation is three alpha v sub o delta t, I would give you credit for that as well. I wouldn't. I wouldn't mark that as incorrect. And what is the change in the volume of this? Hard rubber cube, class? 24, 24 cubic, cubic centimeters is the change. Now, if that's the answer, I'm going to do 24.00 to give myself the fourth sig fig. Does it ask for the change in volume? No, it says what is its volume, meaning what is its new volume? So it was how much? How big? Um, 1,000. 1,000 cubic centimeters, but it increased by 24. So what's the new volume? 1,000, I guess I do V sub F, volume final, 1,024 cubic centimeters, and there's my four sig figs already. Questions on that? Again, if they're looking for area, class, what do we need to do with alpha? Double, Double it, and if they're looking for uh, air, volume, we need to triple it. Now, I said to you that, um, that liquids expand more rapidly than solids, and uh, liquids contract more rapidly than solids. Right? The energy is more, uh, has a greater effect on liquids than it does on solids. Gases even more so. Um, there is one little exception that's really, really important to this. Water will expand when heated, and water will contract when cooled, except right at the freezing point, right around the time water freezes. You remember in chemistry class what the molecules of water do when they freeze? They go from just being whatever, you know, little H2Os to forming little hexagonal crystalline structures, right? And as they do that, that fills empty spaces throughout the, throughout the ice as it's forming. Now, if you were to continue to cool the ice, super cool it, really freeze it really, really cold, the ice would begin to contract down again, okay? So ice even will contract when cooled. But right at the freezing point, as the water's freezing, it will expand which creates gas chambers. That's why ice isn't perfectly clear. You see the little bubbly looking things uh, within the ice, but also that's why the ice cubes float at the top of your drink. Why is that important? Well, what's our earth covered in mostly? Water. And as the water freezes, because it expands at the freezing point, it makes it less dense than all the rest of the water around it, meaning the ice will stay floating, meaning at the top of the bird bath, Big deal. At the, though the birdbath is shallow enough with the deep freeze, it's, it froze all the way through. Um, uh, the top of the river, the top of the lake, the oceans don't freeze. Though some people claim there was an ice age where it did it. Maybe there was. I don't know. I can't speak to that too conclusively. But anyway, um, the top becomes ice. And of course, you can get thick ice as it continues to freeze colder and colder. You can get thick ice that people can drive out on, things like that. That's all up north. We don't know what that's like down here. Um, but you can get thick ice, but the point is the ice stays at the top. Now imagine every other liquid contracts as it cools, including as it freezes. Imagine if water contracted as it froze. It freezes at the top because that's what's in contact with the cold air, right? The air cools first, cools the water that's touching it. Imagine the water freezes, but if it contracted, stay with me, what would happen to it? It would sink. The ice cubes, in a sense, would sink if they were more dense. Well, imagine what would happen if the ice froze that little bit and sunk. A couple things. Number one, if it were a big enough piece, it could crush stuff underneath. But then the next piece that's touching the air freezes and sinks, freezes and sinks, freezes and sinks. Everything dies because there's no water left, right? But because the ice stays at the top, less dense, it insulates. Now, it's still cold under there. I don't know if any of you ever actually been out on like a lake or something when it's frozen over. 
Yeah, me neither. But I've heard stories. And uh, I read Clifford once, and Clifford fell through the ice. And it was cold down there, okay? I've heard, I've read stories about people falling under the ice on a frozen river where there was still a current even moving underneath and trying to rescue the person before they froze to death or got hypothermia under there. It's still really cold, but it's not frozen, right? So it hasn't crushed plants. It hasn't crushed the fish. It hasn't taken away their place to live. And um, isn't that amazing, right? That just by random chance, this world evolved in such a way that the one substance found only on this planet that we know of, that covers much of this planet, happens to go crystalline and expand as it freezes. Isn't evolution amazing? All by random chance that that's the one exception. All because it's two, two hydrogens and an oxygen, and that's the way they do it. Isn't evolution amazing? Or maybe, just maybe, this speaks to an intelligent designer who designed the planet uniquely of all planets to sustain life, right? Just one more example, right? And that's why, I, anyway, I won't get off onto that soapbox. But anyway, we need to know that water expands as it freezes. That's very important to remember. All right, homework, kind of two stages of this. We're going to be kind of wrapping up these first couple sections on thermometry and uh, thermal expansion. That's kind of the section. So you need to study over those pages, pages 206 to 212. Study pages 206 to 212. On page 221, do problems 7, 8, and 11. Page 221, problems 7, 8, and 11. You're going to practice with thermal expansion. We'll do some more practice Monday as well before we wrap up these two sections, if you know what I mean. And uh, then also previewing what's going to come up as well on Monday, previewing the next section where we actually get into heat, the flow of thermal energy. So read pages 213 to 216. Read pages 213 to 216. And on page 220, answer questions 18, 19, and 21. Page 220, answer questions 18, 19, and 21. Quick recap study, pages 206 to 212. On page 221, do problems 7, 8, and 11. Then also read ahead, pages 213 to 216. And on page 220, answer questions 18, 19, and 21. Have a wonderful rest of your day, and you are dismissed.